Whoops. Thorp is there to take the candy. What is going on, everybody? And welcome to another episode of 4th and 15 with Mel and Smooth. As always, I am Mel. And joining me as always, Ronnie Big Smooth Hennigan. Smooth, what's happening, man? Mel, doing pretty good, bro. Nothing much going on here, but I do want to thank our listeners for tuning in once again. As always, we appreciate you guys. Don't know how much it means to us. All right. Um, before... We get started. If I can find my notes, because it was something that it caught my attention. Oh, before we get started, yeah, um, this segment of our show is brought to you in part by Flow and Balance Yoga. You want to get stretch on or just add some peace to your life? Go to Flow and Balance Studios. Visit Flow and Balance Studios at excuse me. Visit Flow and Balance Life for more details. Okay. And we got that out the way. Um, You already know what I'm about to say. Uh, It just went final, actually. So before we go any further, it is official. Rematch with the Niners, Packers for the NFC Championship. Seahawks mount the cup, but it's not enough. Packers win 28-23. And we'll get to that in a minute. But biggest story of the weekend Cleveland Browns find their head coach in Stefanski from the Vikings. I'm on the fence with this one, but it kind of makes sense. It kind of doesn't. Where are you at on this? You know, if it was a year ago, I would be all about it Um, because there wasn't that many options out there. And this is the guy that they kept saying that they wanted to hire. Um, but, you know, they went a different route and chose to go with Kitchens. And he was definitely in the final two a year ago. And to see him go, you know, in there now, I'm kind of thinking to myself, like, okay, you know, what's the difference here? What is it that we need to look out for? Um, is there something that we should be on the fence about as far as, like, his play calling or what he's done in Minnesota? Um, he's had a long time that he's been there for. Um, so that's a good thing that he has some consistency. But at the same time, man, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I feel like as far as what's left over, maybe you know. But yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. With the wait and kind of see how this plays out, I think the thing that bothers me the most though is the fact that you have this guy, what's his name, De Podesta, or whatever, um, and the whole like analytics thing we talked about previous week. You know, he also had his kind of take on it or his influence into the decision itself as well and I think because it's coming partially from him too is why I'm really on the fence about it because like we said last week analytics just does not have any place in football man so I'm definitely on the fence you know what here's my thing um originally you had it to where the guy you wanted was lined up all for you. And we were talking about this earlier. And you had said um, that McDaniel's wife had some influence into why they didn't pick him. Uh, what exactly did you mean by that? Because I, I wasn't aware that she had influence in her husband taking the job that could possibly work out. Oh, yeah. So it was a weird... Um post that was made probably about two or three days ago and basically they were saying that when it comes to the interview process and him getting that interview last week he said that his wife was going to make the trip with him and that she also had to be uh, convinced or to be sold to that you know the Cleveland was going to be the next fit for him and it was weird at first to me because I was like okay well normally you know you want husband and wives kind of be there for each other involved in different decision making stuff like that but with something like this it's like okay you know is there any football experience behind that or is it just you know something that you would look at and go okay is it more so about the way the city looks or you know are there places to stay that look cute or something that's along those lines is it even football related And he basically was saying that my wife had to be convinced as well. And when I first saw that, 
I was like, mm, I don't think that she'll be sold on that at all. Him being one of the guys that's from Ohio, being a product of John Carroll, he's familiar with the area. So for him, it was like, okay, if I go from here, I'm here. It doesn't bother me where I'm at. I'm here. I'm familiar with the area. I'm cool. With her, I don't think she's from anywhere around there. Um, I don't see you know her being sold on something like that unless she knew somebody in the area or grew up around there. It's just not a city that would be appealing to someone like her, I don't believe. So when I saw that, I'm thinking, okay, well, I feel like they're not going to be able to convince her, which in turn, you know, if she's in his ear like, hey, this isn't it, don't take the job, stay where you are or go for something else, that he's probably going to listen to her. Okay, here's my thing. What does that have to do with me taking a job that's going to put food on our table? Now, granted, granted, albeit when McDaniels comes back to New England, he's going to make another four to five million dollars next year. Yep. And that's all fine and well. But what about being the guy that makes history? And what I mean by that is, what if you're the guy who everybody remembers turned the Browns around? Wouldn't that be more like, or wouldn't you think that would mean more? Oh, yeah. And, you know, to your point, I am definitely right there with you. I feel the same way. Um, I'm not sure if there's an issue where, let's say, you know, he's just like that. Like maybe he's just one of those guys that, um, you know, kind of goes with whatever she wants or if maybe there's something that they have to be on the same page about and be able to um, – come to the same agreement on or something like that no matter what it is it could be some kind of thing they are going on with their marriage itself but I do feel like from your perspective and what I agree on as well maybe he would have been that guy that could have done that you know especially with the talent that's been assembled um, he may have been that guy that could probably do that and we will never know that at least not for now um, or mm-hmm. you never know maybe well, I'm still not so on Stefanski but I don't know. We'll kind of see how it plays out, man. Because he had athletes over in Minnesota now, and he's got he he'll have athletes here. But my thing okay. is, you have to push Baker because apparently it's been reported Baker doesn't want to work with a QB coach and nope. he doesn't want to do all the extra work that's needed. So, you know, he wasn't truthfully from what I saw. He wasn't pushed at Oklahoma because if he was pushed at Oklahoma, he'd be a better leader and he wouldn't be in the in the news or or Colin Coward wouldn't be up his ass or all, all willy nilly just because because let's I, sometimes I believe Colin Coward's a dick, but, you know, he's also got a purpose. If he sees something, it's got to be serious. So in hindsight, I don't think Lincoln Riley pushed him to be a better player instead of just being this guy. Mm -hmm. Um, And he gets to Cleveland and Colin Coward. Once again, he pointed out Baker's got more commercials than he's got touchdown passes. It was almost true. You know, he was about even 22 touchdown passes, 21 interceptions. Yeah. You kind of, that sophomore slump kind of looks like it's real for him. So my question is, what's going to happen because truthfully I wanted to coach from uh, San Fran because the defense needs to be straightened out yes. there, there's no if ands or buts about it the defense needs to be disciplined and if you look at San Fran's defense San Fran's defense is legit right Um, they didn't go that route they didn't pick McDaniels they seemed like Stefanski was the guy so I want to know, and I want to see if Stefanski pushes Baker to be a better quarterback and a better leader in the locker room. Because this locker room this year was a total clusterfuck, and I'm not sure Baker's completely down with this. But then again, he could be down with it. They might come together and come to terms on something. We never know until it's time. So... You know, I'm wondering if that is going to be the case to where Stefanski puts a foot up Baker's ass and the offense turns around. OBJ shows up to training camp, mini camp, you know, they got a draft coming up. I I really don't think this was the time to let Dorsey go. No, but, you know, 
we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. We already know. I'm going to say it's a stretch, but I'm pretty sure it might happen. Burrow's going to Cincy. Um, I think Pittsburgh, don't, don't quote me on this just yet. I got a funny feeling. There is a possibility Pittsburgh sneaks into the top five to pick up Chase Young. I I could see that happening with the defensive struggles that they had this year. It wasn't all defensive line. It wasn't all secondary. But with a defensive player on the board like that, I can see Pittsburgh pulling a sneak move and getting in the top five to get Chase Young. So Now, with that being said, mm-hmm. um, C.D. Lamb is, I believe, declaring for the draft. Do you think the Browns pull a move to get into the top five, top ten to pick up C.D. Lamb for Baker? You know, that was Baker's favorite target in college. You know, but you're right. I I don't think D. Podesta is the guy for this type of angle, I'll say. So, I'm just questioning the whole motive behind letting Dorsey go. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you because, you know, at least let the man finish his contract out. I mean, my thing is like, what he's done with the personnel that he's brought in the last two years, I mean, the type of moves that he was doing and making to bring these guys here, and then on top of that to bring someone in like, you know, Jarvis Landry, who has been a vocal you know, part of that message and saying, hey, you know, we want to change the culture around here. It'll start with me and I hope that the other guys pick up. To have someone to be able to be an advocate like that in the locker room who isn't necessarily one of the captains, who isn't necessarily somebody who's mentoring and stuff like that to at least the players off the field, he was doing his thing. I give him a big shout out to what he was doing for the community. Bless that man for that. But as far as in the locker room, you know, he was an advocate. He was somebody who was uh, saying, hey, it starts with me. I hope it starts with you and so forth and so on. And anybody who's had a chance to tune into the little mini series of Building the Browns on YouTube kind of saw that behind the scenes as well, too. The thing is, when you have a player like that in your locker room, definitely is proven, right? Any team would thrive with Jarvis Landry. That's not even an argument. The thing, though, is that when you have someone like that and you have a GM who's pushing it and then you get these other players coming in now believing some stuff, you got Kareem Hunt coming back, us giving him a second chance, which who knows if he'll be re-signed. That's up in the air right now, too, because he had a one-year contract. Nobody's talking about that, right? Then you also right. have a few other guys out there who may not be resigned. Like, I don't think Demarius Randall comes back. Uh, there's a couple people I'll probably get into later on I feel like won't be back. But my thing is... Like you said, Dorsey leaving right now is critical, and I don't feel like that was the right move. Um, something else must have been going on that we'll never know about. But at the same time, man, this was a terrible time to get rid of him. We don't have a plethora of picks just sitting around like we did the last two years to play around with here. We may have one or two extra ones out there. So I don't even know how they would get in the top 10 to make that move, to be honest with you. I mean, anything's possible. Because there's always a team looking to do something. Maybe somebody drops, mm-hmm. you know, maybe Tua drops to the second round. Maybe uh, uh, Trevor Lawrence. Well, Trevor Lawrence, not he's not coming out. But, you know, just saying maybe a player like Trevor Lawrence comes out and, you know, he, he drops just because, you know, maybe tomorrow he doesn't look as good. Right. Who knows? But I can... I can see a couple of teams, mainly the Steelers and maybe mainly the Browns, pulling some type of sneak move to get into the top 10, top five and picking a big move player that helps. And, you know, Dorsey was known for that. So, you know, he pulled off trading a couple first round picks and our best offensive lineman and got OBJ. Granted, OBJ wasn't healthy he was still an impact on the field because he opened up a lot for uh, Landry, the run game when they got it started. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it takes the focus off of, you know, what you have to do or what you're trying to do because it opens up so much just having him on the field. 
No, I agree. So I wouldn't be surprised if something happens between now and the draft. Yeah, it should be interesting, man. I mean, you figure they got the head coach now. They got to find, you know, a GM to get in there. Or I just really hope they're not like, oh, you know, we don't need a GM. We'll just have Deepa Desta make the picks or something crazy like that. No, I don't. I, and, and you know what? I, I don't think that'll happen. I, I've heard they've been looking at, um, I think it was Buffalo's GM. Mm-hmm. And a couple other GMs, but my question was, you had the best GM out of everybody in the league. Why would you need to look for another GM if you don't let this guy go? Exactly. That just... Well, mind-boggling, I know. All right. From that, we move on to some actual, some actual good news. Um, as we all saw yesterday, watching the titans and ravens play was it the titans or ravens mm-hmm. could have been um bill cower is gonna be inducted into the hall of fame this year nice now a lot of people a lot of people don't agree with it just because they're browns fans whatever but let's not forget bill cower was a hell of a linebacker hell of a special teams player for the browns and then became chuck Noll's successor of the Steelers won two Super Bowls and produced arguably some of the best defenses of the late 90s and 2000s. And he's had some great defensive players. Greg Lloyd, Kevin Green, LeVon Kirkland, Troy Polamalu. You know, I think this was something that was long overdue only because of his impact with the organization. Couldn't have happened to a better guy. And the way they did it, I think, was pretty pretty good. Right. And I'm right there with you. And anybody who – I'm going to say this. Anybody who is a fan of Cleveland, right, and you're salty about Bill Cowher getting into the Hall of Fame, that makes no sense. I mean, like you said, this man played for the team, coached with the team because he was, what, a Schottenheimer guy? And mm-hmm. the thing is, it wasn't his fault that he left. He wanted to be here. He wanted to be here. Okay. That's some Art Modell stuff. And people got to remember, man, Modell, the things that Modell has done here, it's just crazy. Like, that was some Modell stuff. I'm sorry. Cower wanted to be here, man. You let the guy slip. You wouldn't give him what he wanted. And he jumped ship. Right. So the first people who made a sweep, they took him and he ran with it, man. And that's just something uh, that's just another transaction. Let's just say it out loud. That is another transaction, another mistake, another false move, or not making something stick that you knew would have been the right decision that we now have to be on the outside looking in, talking about what if this, what if that. That's just another situation with this organization. Exactly. And like I said, I if it's not for Bill, the Steelers don't get a turnaround the way that they turned around so fast. Because oof, let's, let's not let's not forget, or in that time, in that era, the Browns were beating the brakes off the Steelers. You had Buddy Brister at quarterback. Come on, man. Right. You, know, you had Neil O'Donnell throwing the, uh, Larry Allen or Darren Woodson, whoever it was, oof. in the Super Bowl the Cowboys twice. Oof. And if, if not for Neil O'Donnell, Bill Cowher has three Super Bowls. True. Very true. And on top of that, you like, do we really think that, you know, it was going to be this big blow up with Cordell Stewart and, and uh, Tommy Maddox? Oh, man. And you know what? He made it work. That was the great <laughs> thing about it. He, exactly. He had... His whole tenure up until they drafted Ben, Man. his whole tenure as as Pittsburgh's head coach was phenomenal because he had absolutely no quarterback to speak of, and he made it work. Those teams were either in the playoffs, winning the division, or in the hunt. Right. It was either or. It was no gray area. Now, I'm just going to throw this out there and name some running backs off. Barry Foster, Jerome Bettis. Mm-hmm. Willie Parker. Man, Willie Parker. I'm Bell. But he didn't really have Le'Veon Bell, but I think, you know, I think Le'Veon was the the I think he was a successor to what Bill Cowher wanted in his line of running backs. Every last one of those running backs that I just mentioned were 
not only bruisers, but they knew how to run the ball. And you mentioned and, the guy from Michigan State too, right? Yeah. Okay, I was making sure because definitely was a big part of that. Yeah, man, them guys was. <laughs> he couldn't. But he made it. He made it work. He centered. He focused on what he knew, which was defense. He focused around the defense. Okay, Troy's coming out. Let me take a look at Troy on film. Okay, Troy's a hard hitting safety. I had Rob Woodson. I want Troy. I got Jerome Bettis, and we about to draft Ben. That's all I need. Mm-hmm. So. In hindsight, this man was a better coach than I think people, a lot of people give him credit for because you didn't give this man a lot to work with. And it's not it's not a knock against the organization. That was just the talent and the era that he had, he endured yep. and he came up in. You, you're the successor to Chuck No, Mind you, since 1933, or I'll say the 70s, before Mike Tomlin, the Steelers had only had two coaches, Chuck Noll, Bill Cowher. Chuck Noll, 74, 75, 78, 79. The 80s, they stunk up the joint. The 90s, Chuck says, I'm hanging it up. Here's my successor, Bill Cowher. Bill Cowher comes in, 95, oh, 94, 95, playoff team, Super Bowl team. 98, 99, the Browns come back, all right. Let's get it. The 2000s, he gets Ben, he gets Troy, he's got the bus for a few years. They make the Super Bowl. Right. Or do you want from this guy? And the fact that he should have been in on the first ballot, his first, his first eligibility year of eligibility should have that should have happened then. But yeah. putting him in now is still good. I think you know David Baker. Shout out to him because that was a great way to put him in. Like just to let him know he was he had made it. Yeah, I'm definitely happy for him, man. You know, regardless of what anybody say, like at the end of the day, me and Romel both like we're fans of the game, right? We don't have that kind of bias or whatever. Oh my gosh, you know, he used to be with Cleveland, blah blah blah. Who cares? The man did what he had to do, right? Wherever he would have been at, he would have done that. I'm sorry. The way that he yeah. has played yeah. the game, been around the game. Learned under, you know, Schottenheimer got a couple of uh, players that he brought in. I was like, you know what? I'm going to put my eggs in all in one basket because I know it's going to work. It won't even matter. Right. Being like, oh, maybe we'll try this and a couple years later. He's like, no, nah, this is it. Like, this is what I'm rolling with. We making it happen. Right. And that's exactly what went down, man. And yeah, yeah. and it, it is. All right. Um, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Very quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to touch these playoff games because it's next weekend's championship Saturday and Sunday. So when we come back, we're going to get your take on a couple of games and what you thought should have happened as opposed to what did happen. So stick with us. We'll be right back. You guys got something on your mind? or just want to start your very own podcast, have you tried the Anchor app? It's free and easy to use. The creation tools allow you to record and edit your own podcast right from your phone or your computer. Not only is the Anchor app easy to use, but it'll also distribute your podcast so you can be heard not only on the Anchor app, but on Spotify and Apple Podcasts too. In addition to making your own podcast, you can also make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Anchor is everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go online to anchor.fm to get started. All right, and we are back. This portion of our show is brought to you in part by Train Like Rambo at New Life Fitness Camp. Want to share some pounds or get that beach body back and get ready for the summer? Train Like Rambo. You want to holler at Abe Taylor 
at 216-704-8344 or contact him at Abe Taylor Sr. at gmail.com. Again, that's Train Like Rambo at New Life Fitness Camp. Okay. Um, yesterday, divisional round. Tonight, divisional round. We're going to start with um, Vikings Niners. I wanted to say I told you so. I'm really not one to toot my own horn, but toot, toot. I called this last week, and I thought the score was going to be a little higher, but that second half got ugly for the Vikings, and it was all led by the defense. Vikings, Vikings get pummeled 27-10. to 10. I told you it was going to be hard coming into San Fran, and San Fran's defense, not even the crowd, just San Fran's defense made it hard for them to get anything going. When it comes to that game, um, it was just weird because I felt like going into it, there was so much momentum from both teams. They did a decent job previous games that they played. I'm like, okay, well, maybe it'll be a little bit better than what the turnout was. Um, Like you said, the way the game looked today, 49ers definitely should have uh, scored a little bit more um, the way Minnesota was playing. I do feel like also this kind of took me back when you mentioned this game because I was thinking about the question you asked me or our discussion we had last segment about, you know, the head coach hiring of Stefanski. I mean, he literally just went up against the other guy that Cleveland was thinking about hiring, right? And now he's out and the other guy is still in it. So it's almost like, okay, is that you know, a preview of what's to come. Is it not, you know, what, what goes on from here? I do feel like though, however, that, um, with the 49ers now going up against green Bay, um, that'll be an interesting master for sure. You got somebody like my, um, Aaron Rodgers who's been there for a while. He's had an experience. He had a Super Bowl ring already. So it's nothing new to him to be in this kind of position. Has he played against a defense of this level? The last time he, you know, made it or whatever. I mean, once he was in the Super Bowl, yeah. Before that, I can't really say. Um, but overall, with that last game, man, yeah, you definitely called it. Um, I really thought it was going to be a little bit more showing up from the Vikings, and they kind of blew it for me or whatever. But, yeah, man, I definitely did not think the outcome was going to be the way it was, um, especially not – by this measure, I felt like there could have been more points definitely scored, but you, you called it, man. You had it hands down. Well, here, here was the thing. It was, it was something, it was a factor in this game going into this game rather that nobody paid attention to. And that was the rest factor, meaning that bye week that everybody's fighting for come playoff time is so important. And it showed. Yeah. Yeah. Minnesota had the momentum coming off the win against New Orleans in New Orleans, but you only got five days to rest. San Fran had two weeks to prepare, rest. They knew, you know, whoever's going, whoever they, whoever came out of that game had to come to them. So I think that gave them the best advantage. You know, we all we got to do is sit back and chill. Whoever we see, that's who we see. They still got to come to us. And, you know, when you got five days to rest as opposed to two weeks, bruises don't heal up that in that amount of time. Let's just call it what it is. You've played. I've played. I've never seen a bruise that I've had when I've pretty much played all game, giving it 120 percent a bruise heal in two days. Or you know my body get right enough to where I can practice and function properly so I think the rest factor played a big part in you know how does San Fran prepare for Kirk Cousins and this offense they shut down Dalvin Cook uh, they got the Cousins on so many occasions it wasn't funny you know and ironically moving the ball because there was a lot of points to San Fran left on the field True. but but moving the ball 
Minnesota had no answer for that passing game. They didn't. And on top of that, like you said, the bruising, as far as healing up from that, you definitely can't do that in five days, right? And also, what needs to be looked at here as well is they weren't playing against the same level of pass rush playing against the Saints last week. Like, I mean, it's yeah, those are those are two different pass rushes. Yeah. So to be all beat down or beat up and then have to go against San Fran in five days, like the cards just wasn't in their favor, especially going into um, the other stadium. So that's another thing, like you said, that 12th man is real, man. Um, having that, yeah, it is. being able to have your fans behind you and, you know, you got that rest and you're going in feeling good knowing you got to protect your own turf. Totally different mindset from being banged up and having to travel and then trying to play your best against that, <laughs> that front four, man. Just Man, that, <laughs> it's nasty. that front four is, a, is amazing. It's nasty, man. They probably yeah, the line the league hands down, bro. They nasty. <laughs> All right. Moving on from the Niners and Vikings, we go to what I would like to call the biggest upset of the entire playoffs. <laughs> Tennessee rolls into Baltimore and just throttles Baltimore 28 to 12. Mm, mm, mm. Derrick Henry goes off 30 carries, almost 200 yards, no touchdowns, but he basically controlled this game. He threw one though. I, yeah, he did. He did throw a <laughs> touchdown. He did. Um, wasn't expecting that at all. Uh, but the fact that um, the fact that Baltimore got beat at their own game was what surprised me. Mm-hmm. I think I personally believe that this is the scariest team in the playoffs as of right now. I did not think this going in because Tennessee had a tough road. And I thought, you know, going into this, they were either one and done or two and done. They get to that first, they get past the wild card round, they get to that first game against the Ravens. And here we are, they're in the AFC Championship and they're battle tested. They've played their two best teams in the AFC already. They've beaten New England in New England and they go to Baltimore and beat Baltimore. I, I can honestly see the Titans getting to the Super Bowl. If that defense plays the way it did against Baltimore and Derrick Henry goes off for another 100-yard game, it could be bad for Kansas City. Now, here's my take on that because you know, I was having discussions with this about this with people, and I felt like matchup-wise, at least from what we've seen, I felt like a better matchup for Tennessee, like the guarantee – to get to that Super Bowl was against the Texans. Um, what them being knocked we'll talk out, about that one in a minute. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, you already know. Now with them being knocked out, um, I, I kind of was looking at this and thinking to myself, okay, Kansas City's in there. You got Mahomes, who was in the same position a year ago, right? But at the same time, like you said, Tennessee is a team that don't nobody want to play right now, at least in the AFC for sure. And on top of that, it has the makings of the way it was a couple years back when the Eagles won it, right? They come in 10 and 6, you know, they're this wild card team. Nobody believes in them. The start quarterback is hurt and their backup has to, you know, carry them all the way. Oh, everybody wrote them off. Everybody wrote them off. And then all of a sudden they pull off the unthinkable, right? This has that same feeling to it. You got this 9 and 7 team who people felt like was kind of going to be maybe around the same as they were last year or maybe even a game behind, something like that. They're coming in here smacking people, you know. Mike Vrabel's done a great job with that team as far as getting them to be better second half of the year and kind of taking that momentum and going into the playoffs. They are very dangerous to go up against right now for sure. And who would have thought, you know, Ryan Tannehill would be under center um, Man, during this time. I was just about to say that. <laughs> Ryan Tannehill. Oh my gosh. It just now, doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Now, no, it actually does make sense. Ryan Tannehill is a very underrated quarterback, in my opinion. Now, 
what I was gonna say because you you brought him up, but my thing is it's Ryan Tannehill. Mind you, he just left Miami. So what does that say about Miami and quarterbacks? Mm. So they haven't had a good, very good quarterback since Dan Marino retired. True. That's a long time. And you just let Ryan Tannehill go. You gave him nothing to work with outside of Jarvis Landry. True. And he still, he still produced. He was still a winning quarterback. You let him go. He comes to Tennessee and he's the backup quarterback. They bench Mariota, put him in. Now he's a playoff game winning quarterback. He only threw the ball a couple times for 88 yards. What is that saying about Miami and their their situation with quarterbacks? Because it, it's, it's almost as bad as when Cleveland had Tim Couch, Kelly Holcomb. You had two decent quarterbacks, gave them nothing to work with. Right. And they both got beat up out the league. Now, here's Tannehill. Very underrated quarterback, like I said. And you let him go. And he's in Tennessee winning in the playoffs. Yeah, that's scary. That's a scary thought to have, man. And on top of that, you figure, like you said, Miami hasn't done them justice. We've seen teams like that who have had decent QBs that they weren't really willing to build on or, you know, put guys around, stuff like that, expect something to happen. And, man, to have a team like this to – have their old line playing lights out, just doing really, really good. When terms, man, of, they uh, just—I mean, they, they just respect Baltimore's defensive line all night. Did they did? And to me, honestly, even though they only put up twenty-eight, right? Like this loss for them was even worse than the one they took from Cleveland in Week Four. Yeah, it is because I would have took that one because. Basically, Chubb, Chubb was the answer, and we, I, 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 we didn't say this on on air, but I did tell you that might have been the blueprint, and we talked about it. It might have been the blueprint on how to beat Baltimore's defense is to pound them. Mm-hmm. Derrick Henry is that man because anytime you stiff arm a dude three times in the same play, <laughs> and it happens to be the same dude who said they wasn't gonna be worried about you right. come game day. That man is not to be played with. And Derrick Henry tossed toss that dude. Who is it? Earl Thomas? Yep. Earl Thomas. He tossed, he tossed Earl Thomas three times in the same play with the same stiff arm. And that second one spent him around. Man, after that, it's, you get spent like that, it's time to go. You might as well just go on and sit down. You know what I laugh about when you mention Earl Thomas is Every time he opened his mouth, something goes bad. Something bad. So he said the same crap against Cleveland, right? Remember that first game? He's like, man, we sick of hearing about them, blah, blah, blah. You know, we ain't worried about that, whatever. And then they was, just got rolled on that game, right? He kept his mouth shut the second time, though. He didn't say nothing. You know what I mean? Of course. And all of a sudden, it works out, right? So it's just funny because now he's talking that stuff again, right? And Derrick Henry – is not really known to trash talk and stuff like that. No, ain't right. He's huge. That dude is, that dude is massive. Okay, him. Like, why are you that big for no reason? Right, running the ball. It's, it's his size. It's like if Cam Newton was to put on ten more pounds and just be the running back. Like that's Derrick Henry. That dude is tall. He's huge. And he has some speed, and he's just running through cats, man. Like, just running over everybody. You know, in hindsight, you know who that is? Who? That's the second coming to Eddie George. Yeah. In a Titans uniform. Yes. And not not a boy right now. Titans uniform. His running style is exactly like Eddie's when Eddie was in his prime before they left. To come to Tennessee and that transition into Tennessee, mm, yeah. man, it, it's 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 if you look at that game yesterday, I, it's a lot of resemblance in, in in Eddie. I can see that, and it's funny you mention that because you you almost gave me a a nightmare thinking about that. Um, the Houston Oilers, right? So back when it was the Central Division, um, wow. 
they used to give Cleveland fits. Okay. Yeah, they did. I remember going to them games when they played the Oilers because for some reason the Oilers tickets was always the cheapest ones, right? So we had their Muni Stadium and all of that and going to see the Browns play or whatever. And uh, a friend of mine, he was related to um, Gerald Dixon. So we would get tickets, stuff like that, be able to go see the games. And out of nowhere, man, you're like, oh, Tennessee Oilers playing tonight? I mean, sorry, Houston Oilers playing tonight? Okay, we'll see how this goes, you know. And it never really went in our favor a lot of times, you know what I mean? But that was some hard fought games, though, man. But when But you also got to remember, in that division, they were playing a team that was ahead of its time, you know. The shoot was fairly new. So you had Buddy Ryan running that offense, or no, not Buddy Ryan, uh, Jeff Fisher. So, you know, it was Buddy Ryan's team, but I think Jeff Fisher was coming into his own yep. with that offense. He was fresh. So, running the run and shoot the way he ran it, it was different to see it. Because when you looked at Buffalo and their version of the run and shoot, which was the quote-unquote K-gun, it was basically a two-minute offense that nobody could stop because you had no time to prepare for it because those plays were already in. They heading up to the line. The only reason they huddled was to catch their breath. Yep, that was it. And and when you looked at Houston back then, well, the Titans slash Oilers, you saw a accurate quarter, a scary accurate quarterback in Warren Moon. Mm-hmm. You had Lorenzo Wright, Lorenzo White, if you wanted to run the ball just to catch, you know, stop your arm a little break or whatever. You had Lorenzo White, who was a bruiser with some speed. You know, not exactly uh, Willis he breakaway speed, but if he needed to, he could outrun you. And then you had a plethora of receivers that caught the ball. Drew Hill, Webster Slaughter, when he left Cleveland, he was there for a little bit. So it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like a regular run and shoot offense where you run the ball, run the ball, and then just lull them to sleep, and then you toss it over the head. They were shooting more than they were running. And that was the scary part of facing that team back then. So I think I think with this Titans team that you see now, I think the, the philosophy was let's pound them out and then we'll throw the ball and see what happens. But if we pounding them out and they tap it, let's just keep going with it. Yep. And they have the right offensive line and the right running back to do this. And Mike Vrabel is a genius because playing a linebacker, you got to see these kind of running backs. You do. So, so with Mike Vrabel knowing this, I, he told us, I'm pretty sure he told his offensive coordinator, look, I'm new at this, but I'm smart enough to know I got Derrick Henry. So whatever we got to do to get Derrick the ball, to get Derrick to make plays, that's what we going to do. We'll throw the ball if we need to. Against the Ravens, they didn't need to. Right. They didn't. And like you said, Rabel has the smarts to know what to do. I mean, you figure whether it's playing for New England, the collegiate experience that he has as a player and as a coach, um, him just being able to, you know, see that kind of thing or even put himself back in that position and go, you know what? I'm going to show you all exactly what, how this is going to go. I mean, he he seemed like the kind of coach that's like out there on the field with players when he doesn't see something going the way it should, being right there in the middle saying, hey, man, I'm going to need you to step outside this for a second and let me come up in here and show you all exactly where the position it should be at so you get this right. That's the kind right. of coach I feel like Vrabel is. You know what I mean? Like He'll let people do their job, but if he know it don't look right, he's like, look, that's not right, bro. I'm going to show you what to do. And they can go, oh, okay. Okay, cool. Because those are the kind of coaches, like me personally, as a former player, those are the ones that I respected the most. They can go out there and actually show me, not just tell me or point to me or have someone come demonstrate. You yourself, show me what I should do. Big up some Actually, I like those kind of coaches too. I like those coaches too because now, you know, if I screwed up, I can see where I screwed up because when you step in, you're showing me where I should have been as opposed to where I was. Right. Yeah. And and again, 
Vrabel comes from that Belichick coaching tree. All right, folks, we're going to take one more, well, a couple more quick commercial breaks, but when we come back, we're going to touch the games that happen tonight and the impact they'll have on next week's championship weekend. So when we come back, we'll touch those. Just stick with us. All right, and we are back. This portion of our show is brought to you in part by Supreme Clean Car Wash, located at 441 West Avenue in Talmadge, Ohio. If you're down there and you need your car clean, holler at Supreme Clean Car Wash. Number there is 330-633-2809 and ask for Jimmy Melton, the manager. He'll get you together. All right, we're back. Today's games... Uh, set up next weekend Um, Packers Seahawks now I said last week if I'm not mistaken I thought Seattle had a chance but it was going to be very hard because you're going into Lambeau everybody knows how it is in Lambeau you don't win very often and if you do it ain't going to be easy unfortunately the Packers had the lead they never let go of the lead Seahawks play from behind, which I don't think this is their strength this year. Mm-hmm. They end up losing 28-23. I called this one wrong because I thought Seattle was going to come in here defensively, you know, get after Aaron Rodgers, but apparently that wasn't the case. You know, the only thing that I looked at last week that I felt may have been an issue is the fact that Seattle is known to do a similar approach to kind of what Tennessee was doing to pound the you know ball, and they've had so many injuries on that part of the uh, offense anyway. Like the halfbacks that have went down, I think they lost like three of them this year. And all three, yeah. You know to have to re-sign you know Marshawn Lynch to come back and make a couple of other moves like that just wasn't going to be your answer to take you deep in the playoffs anyway. And with them not being able to really run the ball the way they wanted to, as far as efficiency, that definitely takes a big chunk out of their offensive game. Because Russell Westbrook is one of the best at selling a play fake and also play action. Um, With you not having to be able to run the ball, that's just going to be something that's hard to do. And he's a good game manager, but when it comes to stuff like that, that's part of what made them successful. The years they were in the Super Bowl and then also... Uh, what he's been able to do this year as well, too, just in the regular season. But once those guys went down, I'm like, well, we'll see what that defense does. You know what I mean? But overall, they just didn't have an answer for it, man. I don't think it was going to happen. Right. Um, but, you know, here we are. Aaron Rodgers going back to the NFC Championship. Yeah, man. It's a, a, a rematch of a couple weeks back. Mm-hmm. Niners, Niners, Packers. So. But this time you got to go back to San Fran. So we'll see how that one plays out. We'll give our predictions on that later. But this game, I was not expecting to end the way it did. I knew I knew what was going to happen. I just didn't think it was going to happen like this. The Texans have a 24-point lead. And the Chiefs come back and score 28 unanswered points. And then score... Another 25 points, maybe. And they scored so many points in this game, they literally had to apologize to fans at Arrowhead Stadium for running out of fireworks. Ended up winning the game 51-31. They are also hosting the AFC Championship playing the Titans. Uh, Yeah, I I got nothing. I I didn't think 51 points was going to be... Me neither scored <laughs> i didn't i didn't see that happening at all i'm just like okay because the texans have been pretty decent on defense um 
I 51 points, you're like, whoa, what what happened? What, what was y'all doing? Because I get it. I feel as though maybe they got a little comfortable. The coaching staff over there, um, you're like, up oh, 24 nothing, cool. We, we good. We should just build a cruise, you know. And it's like, nah, this is the Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, this is an Andy Reid team. Like, you know, they ain't about to back down like that. You know, this is not a hang your head type of team. You know what I mean? That comes from the top down. I mean, they're known to get some things done and to be able to move the ball. And they have a lot more speed out there this year than they had previously as well, too. So you can't just be like, oh, yeah, write them off like that. Like, that's just, that's just stupid. You know what I'm saying? And, and here's a no, you go ahead, bro. Here's a stat line for you. This would make this game even more interesting to talk about. The Chiefs in this game are the first team and only team so far in NFL playoff history to be down by 20 and win by 20. Yes, yeah, how the hell is that? How do you even pull that off? I mean, that makes no sense. Like, I remember New England coming back on Atlanta in the, in the Super Bowl, you know, a couple years back okay, that's, or whatever. That's, but, that's championship history. We're talking about trying to get to the championship. Well, that's what I mean. I'm just saying in terms of postseason play, right? So the issue is that you see something like this, you see a comeback like that, because I haven't really seen many comebacks um, happen of this caliber. But this right here? I mean, this just opens up a whole new type of discussion or something to look at film wise or whatever. Like, what happened? What do we do wrong? What could have we done different? It's going to be a crazy, crazy, crazy discussion later on when it comes to this team. And what do you do going forward? How does it drag? Man, I don't even want to have that discussion. If I'm, if I'm any defensive player, I don't even want to have that discussion because I might mess around and break something. That's what I'm saying, man. Because you got guys out there like, okay. You brought J.J. Uh, Watt back, right? He was healthy, they say, or whatever. So he plays his thing, his game last week. Then he has a short week, right? Which I don't think he was 100%. So that's another issue. Um, and then you got someone like uh, uh, Whitney Marcellus out there balling or whatever. Um, and then, of course, a familiar name to Cleveland fans, Barcavius Mingo. Uh, was out. He's still alive. Yeah, he's still around, man. Played for the Texans. Wow. Um. Yeah. I just wow. I saw today he played for them because the last thing I saw, he was kind of bouncing around. I think the last team I saw him with was Seattle. So I was just like, "You're on the Texans now." When did that happen? That was very quiet. You know what I mean? Um. Because you know you're. But he was always that quiet player too. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, it, it's just weird, man. He's. For someone to be drafted that high and to be like all of a sudden this journeyman <laughs> going around the league, man, it's like, okay. You know, he's only what, uh, 26, 27. Um, definitely got some years ahead of him, especially that position. And this is like his third or fourth team already. Um, so, you know, shout out to him and getting that check. But like, it, like you said, I don't want to be in that discussion, man, to be like, okay, what do we do? I, mm, yeah, that's a hard. That's a lot of quiet. It's already a quiet plane ride. Oh yeah, nobody talking to nobody. Quiet locker room. You're like uh, you, uh, you still doing that dinner with uh, so and so tomorrow? Yep. Okay. Man, fuck that dinner. <laughs> right. Basically, just mad. Like, you know, man. I think we might have to cancel. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna do that tomorrow. I think um, we're just gonna spend some time with family. You know? Yeah. Man? I want to see none of y'all. Right. Or. You get that one guy who contract up and he knows his last day and he's just going to go home and be like, look, man, um, you know, it's cool. Um, we'll kind of see what happens, but, uh, you know, just in case, y'all on Twitter, right? Y'all, I, yeah. You got yeah. Uber? <laughs> yeah, that's basically what it is. Woo-wee, man. Mm-mm. All right. So with that, we know the championship games are set up. Titans, Chiefs, Niners, Packers. Predictions. What do you see happening? Because me personally, um, my key to the Titans-Chiefs game is this. If you saw what happened to Baltimore, granted, Kansas City's offense has been dynamic all season. But when they played Baltimore, it showed when you ball control 
Patrick Mahomes, you keep him off the field, it does slow him down. If you can't slow down Derrick Henry, <laughs> you got problems all game. Because these last two playoff games, nobody has wanted to tackle Derrick Henry. It showed. Earl Thomas was a prime example. You got stiff arm three times. The second one spun you around, and then he just added that last one to show you you really wasn't going to tackle him. So I think the key to the Chiefs winning this game is score and stopping Derrick Henry. If you can't stop Derrick Henry, you got to put people on him. I don't know if they have the defense to do that, but it's going to be an issue considering, you know, it's Derrick Henry, number one. And number two, if you, we've all seen Ryan Tannehill and how he looks. So if you, if you put bodies on Tannehill, if you put pressure on his face, it does slow him down and it does rattle him a little bit. True. So I'm wondering, you know, can this be a way to where, uh, can this be a way where teams like Kansas City see that Derrick Henry is stronger than what you thought he was and you can stop him? Or is this just a the year of Derrick Henry just making everybody suffer because he know he can. Now, mind you, keep in mind, Tennessee won the regular season meeting back in week 10, 35-32. True. Just, I'm, I'm not going to say this is a repeat, but if Kansas City comes out of this one, they're going to be bruised up. But I, I'm, I'm thinking Mike Vrabel has a game plan for Patrick Mahomes. I feel like he has a game plan for Mahomes. Um, I also think that they're going to have to get creative on defense because Kansas City just has a lot of speed at wide receiver, especially with McCole Hardman. Um, we'll have to see what they do with that. It's just going to be one of those games where it may come down to trying to take Mahomes out the game, like you said, keeping the ball a lot longer as far as time of possession. Um, also containing him and making sure that he doesn't have time to throw. Maybe you'll see a distinct package out there, something that can be disguised, uh, hiding the blitz well if they do choose to blitz. Maybe they do, you know, more of an aggressive approach and go with more man-to-man. It's going to be really interesting to see what they do. Um, I do feel like when it comes to Tennessee, like you said, Derrick Henry's just a bruiser, man. I mean, the thing is, if he gets through your front seven – that's very scary. It's a wrap. Yeah, I just they they're not gonna be able to tackle that man. You know, it's gonna take two not of them, enough. or they gotta like try to dive for some kneecaps or something. But other than that, man, it's just not gonna happen. I feel like Tennessee definitely has an edge, but then once again, you know how Andy Reid does it. Let's say they do some kind of trickery or something. There's gonna have to be a chess match, pretty much. I mean, we saw it happen earlier in the season. Uh, I feel like we may have another game like that. What to kind of wait and see. I feel like whatever team gains that momentum, kind of like earlier mid game, is just going to take that and run with it. I don't see another, you know, down by X amount of points and a big comeback, something like that. I just don't see that happening either. So it's about who's going to get out in front, who's going to be a little bit more aggressive on offense, and who's going to keep that pressure put on their QBs. It's going to be pretty cool to watch, man. I'm very excited for this as an AFC championship. I'm really excited about that. For me, it's a toss up. Now, I, I can't. It is. But mind you, I I I got to throw this out there. The last two defensive games Tennessee has played, they've gotten two interceptions in each game. Brady threw two interceptions. Lamar Jackson threw two interceptions. So they've gotten pressure on those quarterbacks, and they forced them to make Aaron throws. This is interesting. Because, you know, Brady don't throw a lot of interceptions. Very true. And Lamar Jackson has is, is worked on his accuracy from the first year to the second. So, you're coming up against Patrick Mahomes. This is your third quarterback you will be seeing. Very accurate. Very strong-armed. I think 
if they cause me if they cause Mahomes to throw at least one interception, this could play out in the favor of Tennessee, especially knowing Tennessee has the capability to score t- uh, points off of turnovers. True, and that's a difference maker when it comes to takeaways and also being able to score on defense. That's always been a huge boost to any team that's out there, especially in the NFL level. Um, if you got a defense that can score like that or at least put you in scoring position after they do have a takeaway, that's really, really huge. So, um, like you said, man, just be one of the things we'll be watching really closely uh, to see what happens. But, yeah, it looks like Tennessee definitely has an edge. They're just really nasty to play against right now, man. And they have all the confidence in the world regardless of what their record says. And they deserve it because they've played and they've show they can win in hostile environments. You went to the two most hostile environments outside of Arrowhead Stadium you could go to in Foxborough and Baltimore. What else do you need to see? I'm convinced Tennessee has a real legit shot to win this game. Absolutely. They've been battle-tested the most, man. Out of any other yeah. team in the playoffs right now, they've been battle-tested the most and they passed. So, you know, hats out to them, man. If they end up going to the Super Bowl this year, it'd be really good to see. Right. All right, next game, NFC Championship, Packers going to San Fran. One and two seeds. Last time they played was week 12. The Niners beat the brakes off of Green Bay, sacked Aaron Rodgers five times, and, you know, he only had 104 yards passing. I don't think going into this game, I don't think that, you know, Green Bay offensive line is going to have four quarters worth of playing in them to be physical enough to slow down that front seven. And it's really a front seven. It's not just a front four because that front seven of San Fran has been dramatically strong as the game wore on. If you looked at that Vikings game, they were sluggish. Just but just because of the time off. But when they got it in gear, they went after Kirk Cousins in the second half and got three sacks, I believe. And they were on drives where Minnesota was moving the ball. And then when that, that pass rush kicked up, those blitzes kicked in. Minnesota had no answer for it. If Green Bay's offensive line cannot hold up. I see the same thing happening to Aaron Rodgers again. You know, in this game, I definitely agree. I don't feel like the O-line has the ability to play all four quarters with them when it comes to that scheme they run and the type of pass rush they do have. I also feel as though, too, that on the 49ers end, what they're going to have to do is figure out a way to keep Green Bay from getting their running game going because I think they're so focused or I feel like you know historically you would be so focused on what Aaron Rodgers is doing you can't forget who's back there running that ball and the things that they've been able to do that year this year on that end Um, so they have to be ready for that too I do feel as though if they can do all of that and then also um, you know shutting down uh, Devontae Adams then they pretty much got this in the bag I don't see any other kind of tricks they have to be able to do anything different or any other weapons they can kind of go to. It kind of comes down to those three guys and whatever else they can do with their packages. I, I just don't see anything else happening outside of that. And like you said, they're going into 49ers territory on this one. And when Green Bay has to travel like that, um, it could definitely make a difference when it comes to the play of what they do that week. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is the brightest spot that you see coming into this right now. Him having that experience, this isn't something that, you know, Garoppolo's had to deal with as far as a starting quarterback. But we'll kind of see what happens with that, man. I feel like um, the 49ers definitely have an edge on this. And overall, I will say this. I would love to see right now the way that these teams are playing. I would love to see a 49ers Titans Super Bowl game. 
And that is a strong possibility. But you brought up Devontae Adams. Here's the X factor with that. Yes, Devontae Adams is a great player, big play person. Remember, there was a special somebody who got rolled off in Seattle who got an interception last yesterday against Minnesota. Guy by the name of Richard Sherman. Now, he's 100% healthy off his Achilles tear. Richard Sherman ain't no punk, and he's a smart corner. I could see this being a battle all game that it might need to be watched. No, I agree with that. And I'm glad you mentioned that too, because being someone that both, you know, watches the game, um, that reads it from a coaching perspective, and then also someone that, you know, partakes in fantasy, stuff like that. Devontae Adams is not consistent either. I think that's another issue because he'll have a game like he had today or, you know, weeks past, but can he do that again next week? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, you figure the only difference or the one thing that makes him stand out so much this year is the fact that there's no Randall Cobb on the opposite side of the field. Right, right. You have to throw to him now. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, before when you had like Jordy Nelson and Randall Cobb out there with you and that was different you know what I mean you had more guys to spread it out to that you knew could get open you got this guy now and you know you let Cobb go to the Cowboys you're like okay well who else you got left you got some unproven people that want to get their name out there you put a, a higher emphasis on the run game as well even though you do have a quarterback on the level of Aaron Rodgers you almost have to so it's going to come down to that run game, man. Can they gain the yards? I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. But, yeah, I would love to see a 49ers-Titans uh, Super Bowl for sure, man. I would love that. Well, it's a strong possibility. We're going to take one more commercial break, and then we're going to touch on the national championship game that's going on tomorrow. And a special topic, once again, for our cover. Our, actually, it was a trivia contest this week, so... When we get back, we'll touch these issues really quickly and talk about some things that could happen in the future. So stick with us. All right, and we are back. This segment of our show is brought to you in part by Top Notch Removal. You got some stuff you want to get out your house, or you just got a house that you were fixer upper and you want to remove what was left in there? Call Kelvin Moses at Top Notch Removal at 216-800-9910. Okay. Um, as we all know, national championship is tomorrow, and it's LSU versus Clemson. Battle of Dev Valleys, Battle of the Tigers. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. After watching Clemson play Ohio State and getting the breaks that they got, I do not see Clemson getting the same luxury they got against Ohio State. I think LSU is way too focused and they've been on a tear all season. And I think that this game could boil down to can can Clemson's defense keep up with Joe Burrow and Thaddeus Moss, who happens to be, for those that don't know, Randy Moss's son. Man. Man, let me tell you this. So looking at both of these teams, and like you said, the kind of tear that LSU has been on all year and the way Burrow is getting better each game, it seems like, and this being his final game of his collegiate career before he gets drafted. There's a lot on the line for him. 
not just a title, but the fact that it is the last time that he will be a collegiate player. There's so much to leave on the board. Um, he's already broken records. Done what he has to do as a QB. Uh, I just kind of feel as though uh, with this game, I think it's going to have that feel of when Clemson beat down Alabama that year, I feel like it's going to be like that. I feel like they're not going to be able to hang unless they do get that kind of favor, you know, from officiating or something like that. I do not feel they'll be able to hang with them. I don't see a player that can, you know, cover both receivers down the field like that all game. Um, They're very good at getting open when they have to break routes from broken plays. Burrow is good at making things happen down the field. That pass attack is just so nasty. And maybe it comes down to them being so focused on the pass that they implement, you know, a little bit more runs this time around with them kind of wait and see how they do that. But like, you know, Lawrence and what he's done um, over at Clemson, yeah, it was impressive second half of the year, first half of the year, not so much. He was thinking it up a little bit at the beginning, but he turned things around. I just feel like LSU is going to run away with this one. I'm not sure how by much, but it could get ugly. Uh, we've seen that happen with LSU and how they play people. But definitely shout out to what they've done this year. I just kind of feel like they'll run away with it. I don't really see any Clemson um, doing anything different. And uh, yeah, man, this could be the last time we may end up seeing Clemson in this spot. Who knows? You know what? I was thinking the same thing because there's an X factor on defense that I think Trevor Lawrence has to keep an eye on. And that is Derek Stingley. Yes. Now, I know I've mentioned this boy before. This man, this boy, man, whatever you want to, man, boy, whatever you want to call him, is ha- he's been a monster all season. Yes. He's been a monster all season. And he's been in spots where he's either made the hit, he's made the interception, or he's been in on the play to where he disrupted so much timing wise for quarterbacks that it has literally frustrated them into throwing to, into spots that they shouldn't have thrown. Um, Honestly, I think I think he I think he plays a big part in this game. Yes, he's a freshman, but if I'm not mistaken, most of that secondary is either freshman or sophomore. Yeah. So that means they're coming back next year. Yes, they are. And they and they've already handled the bright lights. Oof. You know. And they're playing at home, essentially. You're playing in the Superdome down in New Orleans. Um I, I think this I think this defense plays a big part in Trevor Lawrence maybe having a meltdown. If he handles those first three drives, because we talked about this all the time, even when we're not on the air, those first three drives in a football game are very, very important. Because that first that first drive is, you know, the script. Script your first 15 plays. This is what we run every game. We, ju- we make our adjustments off what they do with this. The second drive, okay. We've seen what they got so far. Let's see what they got this drive. And that third drive is, all right, now it's game time. I don't know if he's going to make it through all of those those three drives in one piece mentally. Yep. Because we saw, now, we saw that Ohio State game, he was rattled. Those first three drives, he was rattled. If it wasn't for the targeting call, I don't think that he's in that game mentally and he stays the same because Chase Young didn't even touch him but a few times he was flustered oh yeah so, he's ready to run after that I mean he saw that man coming he's like, mm. he's like I don't know I don't know am I still here yeah like, is, this, is this still going on whatever somebody had to talk to him on the sideline like look bro regardless of what's going on you still gotta make this happen you are the guy without you yeah this game so um hey let's see and and i think and i think lsu takes him out the game within the first three drives being honest yeah i mean that's the thing like we talk so much about burrow and what he's done for that offense and you know respect game you know what i mean he's done the thing man we can't really argue about that but at the same time no like you said nobody's talking about that defense man You know what I mean? They've definitely shut down some teams. And I feel as though, like you said, the first three 
series that they do have against each other, yeah, Lawrence Mentally might be checked out. Um, you hit him hard enough, knock him down a few times, uh, break up some passes that he normally would make, it's going to be all up in his head. You know, he's not that guy who I see kind of bouncing back from that right away. Um, yeah, this it, is going to be a big, big mental game. And Burrow, man, I mean, he just be out there calm as Sling it. Just slinging it, right? Seeing where to go, guiding guys along the way, and making that Macaulay Culkin face. You know what I mean? Doing what you got to do <laughs> to get the job done. So it should be interesting, man. Right. All right. Um, we did the we did the trivia contest, and once again, same guy. Tom got it right, but uh, he didn't really give me a topic. I guess he caught it late, whatever the case was. But I have a topic of my own. This one we should be able to come to some type of agreement on. Top three football movies. Ooh. Do you have any? Which ones do you have on your top three, and why? Ooh. Um. Well, let's see. <laughs> it's funny because my answer would have been different. Um, you know, fifteen, twenty years ago. But right now, like as an adult, uh, having a small taste of D one, um, I would say this. My top one right now, and it's funny because my top three going to be weird anyway, which people know I can be weird. It's cool. The program <laughs> to me is my top. I love the program. I think it's hilarious. I feel like there's some fiction in there, but there's also some truth as to what was going oh. on. Right, exactly. During that time frame in terms of not only recruiting, but also what they do to keep guys out there on the field and keep them active and doing what they got to do to make sure that they're winning games, right? Um, the program, definitely, yeah. That's my top one for sure. Uh, as far as number two, um, this is going to sound crazy to some people. Um, I would rather watch Friday Night Lights over Remember the Titans. Um, that's not weird at all. That's actually rather funny. Okay, because I was like, Somebody's gonna look at me and go, "What? What are you talking about?" You know what I mean. But Friday Night Lights, I felt like gave us a more realistic look at how things go down at a you know um, a premier a big name school, right? A big name football school, right? Especially at the high school level, um, we saw kind of that went up against some teams like that. But my thing is, you know, on that level, it was different because us coming from. Right, which is now known as the Cleveland Municipal School District. Okay, Cleveland Public <laughs> School is what it was when we went there. Right, public. When it comes to that, um, there's different teams out there throughout the Senate, right? And you don't necessarily have what's called boosters. That was unheard of to us. But you go to play some of these schools out in suburbia, okay? or some private schools, whatever, they had booster clubs. I'm like, what's a booster club? What is that? You know? Um, we all were. Right. We were dumb, befuddled. Right. You're like, you, you get funding? You, you get you get extra, you know, like outings and fundraisers and parents actually. Damn, right. y'all get another set of uniforms? Right, right. You got another set of unis and your names on the back and, you know, all this stuff. I mean, we out here trying to earn the emblem to go on the helm. You, you know what I mean? Man. <laughs> That's Man. a good discussion. I ain't going to. All right. My oh, boy. Yeah, you just bad. bought a whole bunch of, bunch of memories. Yeah, we don't even have time to even talk about that. I'm, I'm, I'm bad. We have to cover that another week. But um, the thing about that is to see someone uh, out there in a school like that to be in a state like Texas, right, where football is king. You know what I mean? Um, to see it on that level to where people are coming from across different counties to come to your games like that. That was unheard of, right? We saw it happen even with Glenville once or twice, but mostly when they were getting close to, you know, their state playoff contention and stuff like that. During the regular season, I mean, yeah, people would show up to watch locally, right? But it wouldn't people come in, let's say, 
if I can put it in perspective for those of you who are from Northeast Ohio, it wasn't like you had people driving all the way up from, you know, Bear Lawn or coming all the way from Sandusky to go to a high school football game during the regular season. That wasn't happening, right? right? State playoff level, of course, right? State playoffs, but regular season, no. And they had that kind of attention down there in Texas, man. And to see Friday Night Lights just put a whole other perspective on it for me. And um, it made me, I won't say regret, but it made me kind of feel, now I'm looking back, um, that I wish I didn't push harder for that offer where – You had coaches from Hilliard Davidson trying to get us to go down there to play down here in Columbus, ironically, where I'm living at, um, to come play with them and what they had set up, whether it was legal or not. I don't know. I'm not (laughs) going to get into that. But because of what they were doing at that time frame and the kind of talent level they had back then in the early 2000s, you could definitely tell they were, you know, picking guys from the state, around the state, trying to bring them in to build some kind of program up they probably weren't allowed to do. Um, but yeah, man, Friday Night Lights is my number two. Number three for me, any given Sunday. Any given Sunday, it, it was a kind of a, um, a hysterical look at the pros, but then also there was some truth to it as well. You saw the endorsements. You saw the house parties, the interaction in the locker room or with the coaching staff, ownership, and all of that, those different subjects that were touched were definitely things that were going on at that time frame and still do for some organizations. Um, you know, when it comes to, like, the things they touch upon in that, and then also, I know this is not a football movie, but you remember that series Playmakers, right? Yeah. So yeah. Stuff like that, and they just so happen to look like the Detroit Lions, but I'm not going to go into that or whatever. You know, all that stuff was happening, man, and it's just sad that these things were not just depictions, but also um, a fictional twist on something real. So yeah, my top right. three, you know, I'm going to go with the program, uh, Friday Night Lights, and then Any Given Sunday. All right. Um... Well, I'll, mine's similar. Um, similar, just a different order. Uh, my top three. I'm gonna start with number three. I'm gonna go with um, necessary roughness. Ooh, good one. Ooh, okay. And All the right. reason why it was because how do you first off how do you get a 34 year 35 year old guy to come back and play football after he's long retired and you know lead a team of guys who never touched the field to their only victory in since the program was almost defunct and shut down wow yeah huh okay and just some of the things in that movie just like the last game where they're playing the, the rivalry game and the linebacker comes through and cracks uh jet paul blake upside the head with an elbow i like you just look at stuff like that. Like, man, you gotta wonder what the ref is looking at, man. That's clearly an elbow to the head. Right. But then but then the, the samurai linebacker gets flagged for karate kicking the quarterback. I was like, come on, man. It, it was a great twist on something that was real because a lot of people don't know that movie was actually based on the SMU scandal. Yes. Yes, it was. So uh, it was a, a funny twist on it, and I, I thought that was a great way to, you know, let people know things like this do happen in college football. Uh, at number two, I got the replacement. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right, Gene Hackman. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, once again, another movie based on something real, the '87 strike, and. It's based on the quote-unquote Washington Sentinels, who were, in hindsight, the Washington Redskins, who lose basically all their players to the strike, get a hodgepodge of guys who have some experience, and end up making the playoffs. And you got Keanu Reeves playing the bum, the washed-up quarterback. Uh, Just, it was just funny. You know, Gene Hackman is arguably the best coach that 
they could pick up and you know he's tired of being snubbed by his owner and I just thought that that was a great a great play to show because you know Keanu Reeves plays like everybody plays John Wick killing everybody over puppy but to see him <laughs> in a football uniform it was cool hey man come on man. I saw John Wick I saw all three of them man like Oh, oh, I, if I knew this is what you do to people <laughs> over a puppy, I'd have just been friends with you a long time ago. But to see him at this side of in a football <laughs> uniform, it was cool. Great. He ain't came all the way from Bill and Ted. Oh man, I'm sorry. I, that was, that hurt, man. I needed that. Oh, I needed that. <laughs> I, I needed that one, bro. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll be focused. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And at number one, I got the program. Uh, for me, this was what college football was really about because this showed everything that they don't tell you when you get to college that you end up you're gonna end up seeing around that time. Uh, and I was just talking to my uh, my boy Josh Robinson earlier about this because he was like, uh, we were talking about the Browns and their coaching uh, search, and we were talking about how the team, what would have happened if Miles Garrett doesn't doesn't get ejected and doesn't get suspended for the rest of the season. And he just comes out of nowhere and he's like, man, you see what happened when ESU lost Steve Latimer for four games? The team took a tailspin. <laughs> and it was so funny because when I sat down and thought about it, it was true. It was, man. It was true. When they lost Latimer because he had a Roy Rage episode, the team actually lost four or well, three straight games. He was out for four, but they lost three straight, and then they end up winning against like North Carolina or Texas or something. So they end up splitting that last four game set before he came back. Man. And I was like, man. And then Alvin Mack and his 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 injury, his whole leg was ended up in a different direction. That that was heartbreaking. Yeah, it was. But it showed that this is what coaches were willing to do to get the program right and they you know thankfully James Cann playing the coach that he played in this movie showed that he had some compassion for his players because you know a lot of people seem to think you're going to college and you know it's a breeze because you got all this money the school has all this money so they're offering all these things but when you really sit down and think about it you're getting these things because of football. Mm-hmm. Football is the fastest sport in America. It's also the most popular sport. True. And he said it best when he was trying to get one of his players reinstated. He said he was yelling at one of the um, one of the administrators, and the administrator said it's not a football vocational school. It's an institute of higher learning. He says, "Yeah, but when was the last time you see eighty thousand people show up to see a chemistry experiment?" Hmm. Back. Once you hear that, once you hear that, you see where football is when you go to college. Point point blank period. Can't knock it. So those are my top three. Um I I we're similar, but we're different. But I, I just thought I'd throw that out there because you know, it's not a lot of football movies out there, but the ones that are out there are worth watching. So if anybody's listening, go watch those six movies. Well, actually five, because we got the program twice. So go watch those four movies, The Replacements, Necessary Roughness, Friday Night Lights, and Any Given Sunday. And if you're not a football fan after that, before that, you will be after watching these movies. Man, I do have to ask you, um, and this is just something like that I thought about while you're talking about those movies. So Any Given Sunday, and then the program. So the guy that played Latimer, in the program is that the same offensive lineman who was in any in that, Sunday yes actually it's funny that you say that because not only is he in any given Sunday he's also in the program but he's also in necessary roughness remember the cowboy why oh wow wow and okay. what's funny about this what's funny it really was really funny about this is nobody pays attention to the fact that I made an actual uh, Facebook post about this. It was a meme kind of almost. I took a picture of 
them when they were in necessary roughness, mm -hmm. when they were stone hands and Wyatt. And then I took another picture of them when they were in the program. And this, the caption was, when you tired of losing at Texas State, so you change your name and um, transfer to ESU. <laughs> Dang. And it, but it's true. Right. If you pay attention, go back and watch those. It's the same two dudes. And here's another fun fact. Um, the guy who plays Alvin Mack, Dwayne Davis, his dad is actually Ozzie da Davis. Ozzie Davis. Ozzie Davis. Um, I think it's Ollie Davis or something like that. He used to play for the Packers. Mm -hmm. And his son is now a football player. Hmm. I believe he graduated already, but I can't I can't get it it take me a minute to look it up, but yeah, he comes from a famous family. His father played for the Packers and you know, his son's playing now currently. So he then went from Texas State to ESU and uh Latimer to end up getting drafted to the to Miami Sharks in any given Sunday. So they both made it. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, Cause I was sitting there like, this dude looked real familiar. And when I yeah. had those clips, it's him. I'm like, that's gotta be the same dude. It's the same dude. You weren't you weren't like you weren't crazy. It's the same guy. He just got tired of losing at Texas State, transferred to ESU <laughs> with uh Featherstone, <laughs> who couldn't catch. So he moved a linebacker and they both played defense. Oh man, that's amazing. You know what? Before we end the show, you know what bugs me about these movies? What's up? Do you realize Omar Epps was in the program? He was fumbling, uh, fumbling Darnell Jefferson. True. Yep. Do you realize every sports movie that uh, Omar Epps is in, he gets the girl, the fine girl. He don't get no ugly girl. He got Halle Berry. He got Sanaa Lathan and Love and Basketball. I need to know what he did, man. Because Come on, come on, man! Like seriously, that's true, man. You get, you know, you get Harry, you get Barry and Sonia Lathan. I mean, the only thing that makes sense to me is maybe it's like a Princess and the Frog situation. Man, I don't want to hear that shit. Because <laughs> if you look at this man's face, thing is pure, unadulterated, dark skin, dark skin, ugly. Oh man. I mean, maybe he turns into some kind of prince and they kiss him enough or something. I don't know. I don't know, but that's that's some BS, man. You get Halle Berry ass and I like Yeah. So now you you fumbled in football, but you still got the girl. So then you, I guess you decide to go play basketball and you blow your knee out and still marry Sinai Lathan and she balling out better than you. Man, come on. Right. It crossed you up and everything. I know, right? Like, this is crazy. Man. All right, folks, that concludes our show for this week. We hope you guys enjoy. Um, don't forget, uh, we are spreading the word on those small businesses. So please show them some support because they are showing us the support and just spread the word on the show. You know, we're trying to give you guys good content. We appreciate everybody that listens. It means a lot. You guys don't even know, but we're letting you know it means a lot. So, you know, just continue to show us the love and support. We appreciate it very much. And thank you guys for tuning in once again. Like Mel said, um, this is something that, you know, we had talked about and we're just glad to be able to make it happen and to bring you guys some, you know, unedited content to the point where we're just two guys out there with an unbiased opinion. Um, it's just been really good to be able to do this and hopefully we can keep it going for a while, man. Indeed. We'll catch you guys next week after NFC and AFC championships. And we'll talk about the national championship for a little bit because it's gonna it's gonna last all week. Once once that game is over, it's gonna have big ramifications in college football. Absolutely. All right, guys, take it easy. Good night. We love you. God bless. <laughs>